It's also been a blessing to watch and see how the adults who have worked with them have grown in their faith. And the challenge that gets presented to all of us is that God asks each of us to take time to grow in his faith, to take the words of his scripture and live into that promise of truth. And so we hear now the words from the gospel of Luke 24th chapter, starting with verse 36 and going through 48. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands, look at my feet, see that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, and while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and he ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses of of these things. May God add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the warming of all of our hearts as we come to full knowledge of what God has in store for us from this, the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, I have to tell you that this has long been a favorite passage of scripture for me. And you might think to yourself, well, you know, it, it doesn't really make, you know, a huge impact as far as we talk about gospel messages. You know, we had all of the kids with the ability to quote John 3.16 when they talk about Jesus' love. This scripture reading out of the gospel of Luke has had a resonation with me because this has shown an image for me that I have lived out in many different ways. And, and it's a very small thing, but it was an important thing for me. You see, Jesus came among his disciples, among those who were a little lost and confused, and he sat around a campfire with them, and he had fish. I've been there. I've sat around a campfire, and I've eaten broiled fish that's been cooked over that fire. And I've had conversation around that campfire. In fact, there's a lot of people over this weekend who have been doing that exact same thing here in Pennsylvania. Having little campfires beside the stream and eating some broiled fish. And they've had some conversation. Maybe some appropriate, maybe some inappropriate. But in the nature of how Jesus worked... He came among his disciples in a place where they were most comfortable. Because sitting around a campfire, they were able to be real. They were able to be themselves. They were able to be relaxed. They were able to be at peace. There's something therapeutic about sitting around a campfire, unless you're that one that the smoke decides to follow everywhere you move. You 
might be the one that might not be enjoying yourself. But for the rest of the people sitting around the campfire, there's a good time. And that's exactly what Jesus came into the midst of. They were having a good time. And Jesus invades that moment and he makes their good time even better. Because Jesus says to them, peace be with you. Now, when we hear peace be with you, we've kind of gotten into that terminology within the church. Peace be with you and the responses and also with you, right? In this scriptural understanding, the Jews, it was common practice for them to offer a message of peace as a greeting and as a farewell. Hey, peace. In fact, they would use the word shalom. Shalom. They would walk up to you. Shalom. And your response, shalom. It was a greeting as common as a handshake, both when you saw a person and when you left a person. Shalom. Peace. Peace be with you. But the trueness of the shalom is different than just a greeting or a goodbye. The, the shalom, the trueness of shalom that Jesus lives into this is a level of completeness. It's more than just peace. It is completeness. It's Jesus coming and saying, my completeness I give to you. Go with my completeness. Be made whole and well in my completeness. Now talk about how relaxing and amazing and wonderful sitting around a campfire is, and then all of a sudden you have all of God's completeness that's given to you as a gift. There's no hot dog or hamburger or mountain pie that will give you God's completeness. And yet that's exactly what God chooses to do in the midst of this. He sits around a campfire and he offers completeness to those who thought that they were comfortable in their own skin. There's a whole lot of us who think we're comfortable in our own skin until God asks us to take it to the next level. And then all of a sudden we don't feel so complete. All of a sudden the excuses can bubble to the surface. All of a sudden, those moments when we have hesitations and, and doubts and fears and anxiousness and, and we can start labeling off the sins that we've been trying to hide away, but all of a sudden they become our focus. Oh God, I'm not good enough because look at this sin and this sin and this sin and this sin. And those are the exact same reasons why God actually chooses every single one of us. He says, in the face of everything that you have done, I want to give you my completeness. I want to give you my heart of fullness. I want to make your life be better and different than it was when you came and sat around this fire to start with. Over the next Sundays, we're going to be having some conversation openly. I don't know if you've noticed, but in your pews, on some of your hymnals, there's a, a paper that's wrapped around the cover of your hymn book. And it reminds us that there is something that we as a congregation support loosely, but now we're being asked and challenged to maybe support more fully. And it's a time and a place and a moment when kids come and gather around a campfire, just like I was describing. Because in our conference, we have for 75 years supported church camps, a retreat center, and different educational opportunities for children, youth, and adults to come full face with Jesus. Now, in your bulletin over the next weeks, you will also see statements that get written up from some of our young people right here in our congregation. And I will tell you, I got a little choked up whenever my 15-year-old, who didn't ask me for help, wrote his own little statement about 
how church camp has impacted his life. And it's there in our bulletins. And I will give you my own faith statement as we go over these next couple of weeks. The reason why I keep saying this is because, you know, we here at Good Shepherd, we're kind of in the rural community of western Pennsylvania. And in some ways, we may even think that we get forgotten about as far as our denomination goes. In some ways, we may think we get forgotten about as far as our conference goes. But we have not been forgotten about with one thing. And I need you to hear this with freshness of ears if you've not heard it before. We, at Good Shepherd, ended up ranking, I believe, third out of the entire conference of all of the churches for sending kids to camp. That means we, we, look around, we, in competition with churches that have 2,000 people who worship on Sunday mornings, we beat all of them. Not that it's a competition, but I want you to take to heart that every year we take a focused effort and we send close to 30 kids to camp. When they get to spend a full week <coughs> Focused on growing in their spirit, growing in their faith, growing in their understanding. Having that moment when they get to sit around a campfire and Jesus himself looks at them and says, Hey, I'd like to give you my completeness. I'd like to make my life be more revealed in your heart. And so when our bishop came... She set down a goal, and she said, I would like to raise $5 million. That's a five followed by a lot of zeros. $5 million over the next five years so that she can create an endowment that will pay for camperships to send kids to camp and also to take care of building up the camp programs at the camps, at the retreat center, and at the extension ministries of our camping and retreat com ministries committee. I can hang my hat on that call. Our congregation was asked, was challenged, was pointed out to set a pace for the rest of the churches in our conference. We were asked to be one of the pilot congregations because they saw out of this community, we're sending a lot of kids to camp because we see a passion behind it. And so over the next three to five years, they'd like Good Shepherd itself, its members, its individual members, to contemplate how we can give. And tentatively, look, we're looking at about between $18,000 and $20,000 over the next three to five years, they would like to, uh, to ask us to raise. I will tell you, $18,000 to $20,000 over the next three to five years is not that much. In fact, I know that this is something that you can see yourself fitting into as a plan. I know that my own family can find itself finding a way to make this happen because I know that this is individually changing lives and giving a great shalom in the midst of who we are, where we are, and why we are. Our young people, just like the ones that we saw here, they are the future, not only of our community, not only of our nation, they are the future of our church. They are the future of Jesus Christ's discipleship and ministry. And if we are not setting them apart as a focus of our goals, as a focus of our ministry, as a focus of where we focus in on our care, our compassion, our love, and our completeness, then we're missing the boat. And that's exactly the challenge that Jesus saw because, you know, 
He appeared, he appeared right there to those disciples, and they were sitting there. And they were okay just doing their own thing. I will tell you, I'm okay just doing my own thing. I'm okay creating my own peace. I'm, creating, I'm, I'm good creating my own little circle and sphere of influence. But when you have God that comes right there and sits down beside you and says, every single one of these kids, they've got a message of the gospel truth that will blow your mind away. I will tell you that there are youth in this congregation who have had some of the most amazing spiritual experiences sitting around campfires at our church camps. And they have a spirit and a passion and they have a word and a message and a good news to share. But we don't often ask them. And they're afraid sometimes to speak up. We have those of us who are gathered in this place and we're, we're just like the disciples. We want to sit and just be comfortable. We want to be left alone. We don't want to come out of our comfort zone. But then all of a sudden, whenever we get pushed, it all makes sense. And that's exactly what Jesus chooses to do. Because as you heard in those gospel words, when Jesus came, he said, I opened their minds to understand the scripture. The great shalom that he offered wasn't just about Jesus dying on a cross. It wasn't just about forgiveness of sins. It wasn't just about changing the world. It was changing you and I individually. Our world, our community, our nation, it starts with you and I. God wants to change you personally. He wants to come and open your mind to the scriptures. Can you imagine how, how passion-filled that conversation would be? When Jesus wants to come and sit down right beside you and talk about what makes you tick wants to talk about just you, you personally. And that's exactly what Jesus chooses to do. He wants to come right here, right now, into your heart and have that kind of conversation that he says, I want to give you my completeness. I want to open my scriptures to you. I want to reveal myself to you so that you will be irrevocably changed forever. I want to take you as a lost sinner and I want to give you my salvation. I want to take you as one who is without direction and I want to give you my complete direction. I want to take you and give you everything that you've always not known you needed. God doesn't give us exactly what we think we need. He gives us exactly what we truly need. And what God truly knows that we need is his completeness. It's more than peace. God wants to give you his love that changes everything. God wants to reveal himself in such a way that it's like sitting down with your best friend and talking about anything. And everything. It's like sitting down with that best friend who can look at you square in the eye and say, John, you got a fleck of garbage between your teeth. Get rid of it because you look like a fool. Not just anybody can say that. But our God wants to look at us and he wants to have that kind of relationship where he says to you and I, you've got some mess ups. You've got some screw-ups. You've got some dirt on you. You've got some sins you're struggling with.
but I want to partner with you. And I want to give you that completeness. When we think about sitting down with the lover of our souls, the best friend of our lives, the one who can focus us, redirect us, challenge us, care for us. That's what God does when he comes around that circle of the campfire and says, peace be with you. My shalom, my completeness, my care. I don't think there's a single one of us in this place who doesn't need that. And I don't think there's a single one of us in this place who doesn't want to give that gift to somebody else. So I think it's time for us to kick back our chairs because the circle of the fire is getting a little bit bigger. Look to your left, look to your right, look in front of you, look in behind you. There are people that God wants you to help find completeness in his spirit. Open your mouths and don't let your silly words come out. Open your mouths and let God's given word come out. I pray that the Holy Spirit comes upon all of us so that we can find his great shalom, that we have our minds opened and scripture filled and that we find a new direction give this gift to one another give this gift to our kids give this gift to the ones that you love give this gift when you look in the mirror and when you see all the faults Realize that you see what God sees. A blessed and loved child of God. Who he wants to give his great shalom to. May you live into God's completeness. And may you live into God's fullness. Jesus paid the price for you and I. And he comes into your circle. have that conversation with him and hear him calling your name for the first time for the 90th time for the eternal time God's speaking your name and he says sinner come home may you find his completeness let us pray Lord God, I need you now. We all need you now. You come into our place. You come into our hearts. You sit down with us. You have meal with us. You break bread and fish with us. And you say to us, I love you. I know you've messed up, but I love you. Take my hand, call out my name, and I will save you from everything. Let it be so, Lord. We call out your name. We ask for your great shalom. We ask for your peace. We ask for your completeness. We ask for your salvation. We ask to be born anew. We ask to be born afresh. We ask to be born again in your image. Let it be so. And so, Lord, come into every single one of our hearts today. Open our eyes. Open our ears. Touch our hearts and send us so that we may go and live for you. We come as we are, but we don't leave as we are. We leave as your chosen people. 
And so, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, be with us now and always. And all God's people say, if you're able, then let us stand that we might join together in our final hymn, the day of resurrection. Christ our Lord and Savior be yours today, now, and forever. May the blessing of God come upon you richly in this moment, that as you leave from this place, you are a changed people. May the blessing over the meal that occurs downstairs, at home, or wherever you are, may the blessing be like the blessing over that broiled fish that gives you completeness, because God comes into your circle and says, my peace my completeness, my heart, my soul, my life is yours. Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.